Welcome everyone to our Bible study on Revelation, explaining the scary stuff chapter by chapter. And we're actually into the chapter full fledged now. We're done with our videos. So uh, we're going to start with chapter one. And um, you need Bibles. You'll need Bibles for reading Revelation. However, um, as I put this together earlier today, uh, God's mercy and grace and compassion fell on you. So we're going to be going to a lot of different places in the Bible. But I put all of those verses outside of Revelation on the screen. Now, I can't guarantee that I'm going to do that <laughs> as we that. continue. What's that? He said, thank you. Uh, I'm not sure. I mean, I might get, you know, law, the law might take over uh, for grace next week. But we'll, we'll do that. I mean, it's not, um, it would not be advantageous for us. We would not move at a very fast pace. So I understand sure. Let's begin with prayer. As soon as my slides decide they want to work. Heavenly Father, we come before you because we are studying your word. Send your spirit, the author of this book, the true author that revealed to John. Jesus, be there because these visions were sent by you. Father, it's your message that we read. Triune God, be with us this day. Help us to understand these difficult things and to keep in mind that this book was given for the church in the first century that was suffering terrible persecution, and it's for us today as we have persecution in our lives. Nowhere near what they were going through, Lord, but in every single age, the, the church runs into problems. We have crosses to carry. And may this, this message, this book, help us to carry those in faith, knowing that one day it will all end. And even now, you are with us to lighten our load. You carry the burden for us. You carried the burden to the cross and from the tomb. And because of you rose again from the dead, we have a wonderful, wonderful hope. It's in that hope and in that faith that we pray and ask you to take care of these things that are troubling our lives and the lives of our friends. Be with Doreen and her son, Joe, as they worry and, and fret over Lauren. Be with Lauren as she heals from her car accident. Be with her boyfriend, Austin, as he heals. Uh, grant them a quick recovery and freedom from pain. Uh, keep them all in steadfast faith. Lift them up when dark days come and when they feel down. Give them the strength to stay by her, to stand by her side. May Lauren turn to you in faith and look to you as the healing God that you are. Lord, in your mercy. Here are you. Be with Grace as she suffers from shingles. Grant her complete recovery. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Be with Carrie as she suffers from gout. Grant her complete recovery and healing and freedom from pain. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Heavenly Father, as we lift up uh, our sister Joan to you, we're thankful that they were able to finally find out the problems that she was having, the reason for the problems she was having. And it, and it appears, Lord, that they, uh, they've been calmed down. Grant her continued peace in her mind and ability to use her limbs. Be with Reverend Art, grant him uh, comfort and peace as, as uh, help him to decompress from this time of stress and be with both of them going forward. Lift them up and care for them in your precious loving arms. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. <laughs> be with Randy and his wife as they mourn the loss of their son who committed suicide. Lord, in all of our young people's lives, May they learn and know that life is a wonderful gift from you and that you love them. Baptism is a sign of that love. Grant them to know that no matter what happens in their life, they are loved and their life is valuable. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. prayer. We give thanks, Lord, that John has returned safely from Latvia. Be with John and Mike as they are going to move into a new home. We ask that, that would be a blessing for him and uh, for Mike, and we will miss them, but uh, uh, may this work out uh, for their ultimate good. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Yeah. We give thanks for all those who are traveling over the holiday weekend, including Ron and Karen. Thank you for bringing them all safely back to us. Be with all those who will be traveling, especially Rob as he travels up here this coming weekend. Uh, grant him a safe trip up. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. 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 Be with Brian, Sharon's brother, as he enters hospice, and with his wife, Chris, as she cares for him. Lord, according to your will and plan, take him gently and without pain. 
Lord, in your mercy. Be with Jack, Lord, as he goes for cancer surgery on June 14th. And be with Jill as she cares for him throughout this process. Lord, in your mercy. We're thankful, Lord, for the healing you've granted our brother, Dale Norrington. Uh, we ask that you would be with him. And, and if it is for his best interest, that he might be released to come home. And at home, he might continue to heal and return to normal. Lord, in your mercy. Be with me, Lord. Grant me healing, head to toe, body and soul. Lift me up. Help me to be the shepherd in this place you called me to be. Uh, grant me the physical strength and the spiritual strength and the emotional strength <laughs> to be your servant in this place. Lord, in your mercy. Be with Karen as she begins physical therapy tomorrow, that it would be uh, at least amount of pain as possible and be with uh, Ron as, she, as he stands by her side through this. Lord, in your mercy. Be with Karen Berger on son Michael as he tested positive for COVID. We, we pray that the symptoms would be slight and, he would, and you would bring him through this and he would give you glory. Lord, in your mercy. Be with those places in this world that are suffering pain and war, especially in the Ukraine. Be with the people that are fighting in the army. Be with those that are trapped in cities. Be with the refugees who are leading the country and be with all of the uh, organizations that are providing help including and especially Lutheran World Relief, that they might continue to help not only people in the country, but those refugees find a place, a safe place to live. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Be with those in <clears throat> Uvalde, Texas, also in Buffalo, and other places where gun violence has taken lives. Be with those who are left or are affected by the shooting. Be with those little children. May you grant them peace and comfort and hope. Be with all of the authorities in the... <clears throat> first responders and the police, grant them a wisdom to know what to do and grant us to provide <clears throat> means that we can prevent this from ever happening again. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. all of these things we commend over into your care, dear Heavenly Father, trusting in your mercy that comes to us through your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and all God's people respond. Amen. Amen. Oh, I don't want to go there yet. Okay, <clears throat> we've got our sheets in front of us. That's kind of the study guide we're going to be going by. It'll guide us through uh, what verses we're going to read. And uh, so let's start out. <clears throat> I did not include reading the first uh, several verses because uh, we talked about that last Sunday, but uh, or last Wednesday. But I'll give a quick update about it. Uh, the first couple words of the prologue, the first couple verses. Uh, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants. Who are his servants? We are. In fact, a better way, probably the more correct translation is slaves. <clears throat> we don't like to use that because slavery has a bad connotation to the South, but servants earn their keep, slaves do not. Slaves are provided for by their master, and that's us. God provides everything mercifully and graciously for us. He is the loving slave master that anybody could ever have. And so we need not fear that connotation, but know that he cares for us. So we are those uh, slaves, and this whole book is to tell us what soon must take place. So that means all of these things, are any of these optional that we're going to read about as we continue to study Revelation? No. They must take place for what reason? To show us, to point towards the end. So that the end might come. Right. So the end might come. If these things didn't happen, Jesus isn't going to return. And we want that. However, that includes some, well, look around you. The shooting in Texas, the shooting in Buffalo, the war, all of these things are all listed in Revelation. It's nothing new. They're out there. So Revelation just storms. Yep. Yeah. Revelation doesn't pull any punches. It just tells it like it is. But along with that, it gives us the grace and comfort and assurance of Jesus Christ that he is indeed controlling all things. So let's start and read, uh, to start off with, let's read verses 4 through 8. I guess I can put that on the screen. Mm -hmm. I see that. 
No, you'll see it in just a moment. There you go. Revelation 4 through 8, the greeting to the seven churches. John to the seven churches that are in Asia. Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. And from the seven spirits who are before his throne. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead and the ruler of kings on earth. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierce him, and all tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. So here we have the address. This is a letter. Revelation was a letter that John wrote that contains uh, visions that he was given uh, from Jesus. Uh, many of them um, kind of, I don't know, not, not manipulated, but introduced by an angel, but they come from Christ himself. Um, so this being a letter, we have who it's addressed to and from at the very top. So it's from who in verse four? John. And we talked about last week, John is not mentioned, um, but who would this John be back from verse one or two? Made known to uh, his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ to all that he saw. Who is the John that gave witness to Jesus Christ? The one that Jesus loved. The apostle John, right, the disciple that Jesus loved. So that's the John, he's writing this. And uh, he's writing it, uh, and also... He uh, extends grace and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. Who is that? Jesus. 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 Let's, let's look in uh, back to our PowerPoint. And uh, we're going to look at Exodus 3, 13 to 14. And like I said, I was merciful to you. I've got all these verses out there. So. <clears throat> Somebody care to read Exodus 3, 13 to 14. And Moses said to God, if I come to the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. I am is a Hebrew word. It's an imperative. And it is kind of timeless. So you can translate it as uh, I have been who I have been. I am who I am. I will be who I will be. How does that match with the idea of who is and who was and who is to come? And it's saying the same thing. It is. And then somebody read Malachi uh, 3 6. For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore, you. O children of Jacob, are not consumed. He's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, right? He who, he's the one who is, who was, and who is to come. Therefore, who is this? And uh, who is that one that's first addressed? God the Father. God the Father. Then, we have from the seven spirits who are before the throne. Seven spirits. We talked about numbers. Uh, uh, Pastor um, Klaus uh, talked about numbers in Revelation having special importance. Does anybody remember what the number seven? Jesus. Why that's important? Seven is the number three, which is. Uh, the Trinity, and you add that to four, and four is? Four corners, four corners of the earth. The triune God working across all the earth, all places, all times. Yeah, was like God. God working. So, therefore, what does this say about the spirit that's being referenced? First of all, is it, is it an angel? 
Is it a demon? It's the Holy Spirit. It's got to be the Holy Spirit because the Trinity is involved, right? It's God working throughout all times and all spaces. So the sevenfold spirit is the spirit who's been working where? Everywhere on the earth, throughout all time. So we have God the Father addressed. We have God the Holy Spirit addressed. As we continue on, how is Jesus described by John in these verses? A faithful witness. A faithful witness, what else? Firstborn of the dead. Firstborn of the dead, and what else? Ruler of kings on earth. So why is he the faithful witness? Somebody care to read John 1? We've got 1 through 3, and then uh, that second paragraph down is verse uh, 14. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. He's the Word, who is God, and what does what do words do? Why do we use words? The Word is the witness. We describe things, right? God's Word tells us who he is and what he wants and what he does. Jesus is the Word made flesh who came and dwelt among us. He is God in human flesh to describe who God is in a way that we can most accurately understand because here it is in humanity. Otherwise, God is a spirit, right? He's a mystery. We don't know. We only know what he reveals to us, but he does reveal some things. God the Father does. But here is he sent Jesus. This is who I am so you can understand me. And how do we understand Jesus is God? And he's the one that came to die. He took on flesh so that God could experience death. Something that we don't ever want to experience and are afraid of, and he took on flesh so he could for you. And not just temporal death, he suffered your eternal death and died. That kind of makes him a faithful witness, doesn't it? Doesn't it? He called himself a faithful witness. Let's look at uh, John 5, 36 to 39. But the testimony that I have is greater than that of John the Baptist. For the works that the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I am doing, bear witness about me that the Father has sent me. And the Father who sent me has himself borne witness about me. His voice you have never heard, his form you have never seen. And you do not have his word abiding in you, for you do not believe the one whom he has sent. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness, and I don't know what the rest of the words are. About, about, about me. me. About me. <laughs> so Christ is calling himself what kind of a witness? A faithful witness. Faithful. To God. The faithful witness of God to mankind. He, he, he ascended to the right hand of God and was given that glory because he was a faithful witness, obedient in all God asked him to do. So it makes sense that John calls him a faithful witness. And you're an Old Testament church. When you see that, the Gospels have been out there. John wrote that, that, that uh, you know, John 1, that's him saying, John, you think you might think of this? Faithful witness? Ah, oh, yeah. That's Jesus being the Word made flesh. So how about uh, firstborn from the dead? Let's read Colossians 1, 15 through 19. He is in the image of the invisible God, 
was first born of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, and that in everything he might be permanent. Preeminent. 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 For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. So we have Jesus, Paul is definitely saying he's God. He's God in the flesh, but what also does he call him in verse 18? He is the firstborn from the dead. What does that mean for us? Because Jesus died and rose again, we will too. We'll have eternal life. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 15, 20 to 23. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead and the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by man came death, by man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive, but each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. So Christ is not the firstborn in a very Jewish kind of way of saying that it's first fruits. When you gave an offering of your wheat or your produce, you gave a first fruit, which is the first of the harvest. It was considered many times to be the best. And so it's the first thing on the vine, and you're kind of acting out of faith because what if there isn't any more? What if that's all there is? But God said, you be faithful and give me the first fruits and I will make sure you have enough after to keep you alive. Christ is the first fruits from the dead. Because he rose again, there'll be plenty more and that plenty more is us. So as, as uh, John in here describes him as firstborn of the dead, what would that tell you as the church who's suffering in persecution? Yeah. Yeah. No matter what happens in this life, we will rise again. Never to die. Just as Jesus did. All right. Uh, and then we have, he is the ruler of the kings of the earth. Let's look at why John would write that. Once again, 1 Corinthians 15, a couple verses later, 24 to 27. Christ must rule until God has put every enemy under his control. The last enemy he will destroy is death. Clearly, God has put everything under Christ's authority. What does that sound like? Control. Ruler of the kings of the earth? God has put every enemy, everything under Christ's control. And then Jesus himself in Matthew 28, 18 said, When Jesus came near, he spoke to them. He said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Is Putin in charge? No. no. Bush? No. no. The Ayatollah in Iraq? No. Democratic Party, the Republican Party? No. The NRA? No. No. He's what in control. Huh? What about the Jews? They're definitely not in control. <laughs> well, there is one Jew who is in control. Yeah. Christ. Yeah. We forget that sometimes, don't we? And then one more to look at. Revelation 17, 14. We'll use Revelation to help explain itself. Somebody want to read this? They will make war on the Lamb, and the Lamb will conquer them. For he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and those with him are called and chosen and faithful. So as the church is suffering persecution from Rome, and then later from other powers and, and, and other uh, empires that came and followed, what does this tell them? God's wisdom. He's ruling. 
these powers that are that are telling them that they can't talk about Jesus and they can't meet and they can't be the church, they're not in control. The one who we preach and worship, he's in control. Just because you're told that you can't go talk about Jesus, there's somebody higher that says, yeah, you can and you should. <laughs> Government says that we, if, if ever they were to pass a law that we can't meet as a church or we can't preach, even if it's about what we believe about abortion, of course, you don't want to go outside an abortion clinic and point people and say murder. But you have every right to say what it is in a loving, respectful way. Because he's in charge. But Christ is in control. Does anybody have to watch the news on today? The morning news shows? No. Guess what? <coughs> what are all those letters? It's gay pride, LGBT, whatever it is. Yeah. Months. Yeah. And every morning show other than Fox News is celebrating it all month long. You know what? And, and, and we we don't we don't yell at those people, we don't laugh at them. We love them. We pray for them and love them and try to show them that we're not monsters. But at the same time, we cannot condone that lifestyle. That lifestyle stands against what God says is good, right, and salutary. It's not how God told us to live. It's not there in the Garden of Eden. We can't condone that. But we still, we love them. They need to hear the gospel. And probably the first thing we need to preach is not that you're a terrible sinner. I'm a sinner. You're a sinner. Not just because of what you're doing, but and the commandments. You fail at them, I fail at them. Jesus is the answer for me, and he's the answer for you. Faith in Christ, Holy Spirit begins working in their heart and their mind. That will be what changes them. So that would be my way if, if you're going, if you have a chance, and you're not going to witness walk up to somebody on the street standing outside in a LBGTQ parade. But if you know somebody, you come alongside them, look, look for chinks in the armor. I mean, look for ways that this lifestyle is not working for them and they're upset and they're in pain and they're suffering and they're unsure. Then give them the answer of love. Give them Jesus. Because in your life, even though you're not LGBTQ, the pain and the suffering and the fear that you have in your life, who's the answer for it? It's Jesus. Jesus, and it is for them too. Thanks, Faithy. That's good. <coughs> So, when John says that Jesus is the ruler of the kings of the earth, what kind of hope and comfort does that give the first century church? Yeah. What's happening is not beyond his control or even surprising him. He knows. In fact, he allows it. And we'll see that when we continue on, especially when you get to the, the, the vision of the seals, the seven seals. All of those things are ushered in by him, by Jesus. So, <clears throat> we have the Father, we have the sevenfold spirit, which is the Holy Spirit. This is clearly the Son of God, Jesus. What would we say this greeting is? It's the same way we start every single service. Trinitarian. It's in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. John starts out his letter with a Trinitarian greeting. Because this would be read in worship. It was meant to be read in worship. This is Christ speaking to us, which is what he does in worship. Verse 6. Uh, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood... And made us a kingdom of priests. <clears throat> That's us, right? Made us a kingdom of priests. How is it that he made us a kingdom of priests? I thought you guys were laity. Why would he call us a kingdom, uh, kingdom of priests? Let's look at, read uh, 1 Peter 2, verse 5. You are set like living stones are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, brought for spiritual sacrifices, acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. No more temple in Jerusalem. We have Lamb of God as a location, but that Lamb of God, this building is not the church. You guys are the church. 
and I'm the church. We're the spiritual stones that make it up, and we're called to be a holy priesthood. And <clears throat> what does Peter tell us that holy priesthood does? Spiritual sacrifice. Spiritual sacrifice is acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Spiritual. So it's not your turn next week, Gary, to bring a lamb, and then John, you bring a bull, and Irv, you bring an ox. We don't do those kind of sacrifices anymore. What are spiritual sacrifices? Well, first of all, what is a sacrifice? What's that? Your mind and soul. <clears throat> what does a sacrifice mean? Any kind of a sacrifice, what does that mean for you if you're giving it? Giving up something. Yes. Giving. Time. You're, 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 getting, you're giving up something. So there's some cost involved, right? And that cost would be time, talent, or treasures. So what are spiritual sacrifices that we are called to make? Give us an example. Worship, mm -hmm. prayer, mm -hmm. Bible study, mm -hmm. joining the choir, doing altar kill, mission lead, quilters. All those things involve Franklin time. Mission. So, yeah. Franklin Mission help cook, go down there and help serve. All of those things involve time and talents, right? Have we talked about treasures at all? Not yet. <laughs> no. Because a bigger thing is time and talent. Um, what, what does that saying go? Um, where your heart is? There's so much. How does that go? Help me out here. Where your heart is, where your treasure, where your treasure is, your heart will be also, or whatever, right? If your heart is with Jesus, what naturally comes next? Treasure. If you get involved with your time and talents with ministry, Tom, when you went down to Franklin Avenue Mission, did it turn you off from ever serving down there again? No. I didn't go yesterday, but that's that okay. Turn me on. What, what's your reaction when you do go? The biggest thing is a sense of satisfaction that I've reached out to people. Make you glad you went? Yeah. Does it encourage to go again? Yeah. And it's that's like it's like coming here to Bible study. Well, I, we go home tonight, but I'm ready to come back on Sunday morning. And then when Wednesday morning comes around. When, when we give of our time and our talents and service to the Lord, it changes us. And I found that there's times uh, I didn't go to Franklin Avenue Mission yesterday, but I used to say, you know what, I really don't want to go down there, but I guess I better. You get down there and I'm dang glad that I did. And that's true with a lot of things. Do it even if your heart's not there because the Lord is great at changing your heart and your mind. He's awesome about that. At least he is for me. Actually, when you think about it, it's, it's you and I are that are being, are the ones being served. They don't know how they feel when they walk out of there, they being the people that we fed a meal to. Or, so we are a kingdom of priests to God and Father. And then uh, uh, John gives said, be glory. Uh, and dominion to him forever and ever. Amen. Verse 7. <clears throat> Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all tribes of the earth will wail on account of him ever so. Amen. In verse 7, what is John reminding the church of as it suffers persecution? Christ. Crucifixion. Let's read Acts 1, uh, 9 through 11. Somebody care to tackle that? After he had said this, he was taken to heaven. A cloud hid him so that they could no longer see him. They were staring into the sky as he departed. Suddenly two men in white clothes stood near them. They asked, why are you men from Galilee standing here looking at the sky? Jesus, who was taken from you to heaven, will come back in the same way that you saw him go to heaven. Come back in the clouds. 
just to see ascended into the clouds on Ascension Day? What do the angels remind us? Behold, he is coming. Seems like we heard that in Revelation uh, the last couple Sundays, didn't we? Behold, he is coming in the clouds. There'll be two reactions. Ours will be joyful. And those who don't believe, the exact opposite. Let's look at Mark, 10, Mark uh, 14, 62. Somebody care to read that? Jesus answered, yes, I am. And you will see the Son of Man in the highest position in heaven. He will be coming with the clouds of heaven. There's Jesus himself reminding us. John says that when he does come, every eye will see him. That'll be ours. That'll be unbelievers. Even those who pierced him. Unbelievers. Maybe some of those became believers, but also unbelievers. And all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. In Revelation, when you hear about the earth, it generally means the unbelieving world. When Jesus returns, the unbelievers will do what? Yeah. Why do you think? What's that? Norma? You said wail. Why? Why will the unbelievers wail when Jesus appears? Because we'll know the big mistake they made. Because they, what they didn't do, that they, they, they see they missed the point for their damnation. <laughs> They, they, the gospel was presented to them. The church witnessed over and over to Jesus being Lord and Savior, King of all creation. They refused to believe, and now it is too late. Too late. How have you felt those times when you come upon that? Something you, you should have taken advantage of an opportunity, not necessarily spiritual, but you should have taken advantage of an opportunity, and now it's too late how does that make you feel angry with myself angry with yourself what else Sad. embarrassed what else Sad. Sad. <coughs> frustrated take those emotions you felt and multiply them by infinity because their mistake means forever the truth will be known when jesus returns nobody will be able to deny it even those that said, oh, there is no God, and there is no Christ, they'll have to face it. And they'll know. They'll know. <clears throat> to their damnation, they'll know. And to the church suffering, it means glory for us, but justice, justice will be served. Those that put the church to death, those members to death saying, renounce Christ or die, they'll get what's coming. In fact, Lord be with them that they might, Lord might be merciful to them because they don't have any idea what lies ahead for them because they don't believe. Questions or comments up to this point? <clears throat> Verse 8 We have, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Notice here, before that, we have to him, behold, he is coming, grace, mercy, and peace from him who is, was, and is to come. Uh, you grammarians, what's the verb <laughs> tense there? What's the, what's the tense of those uh, adverbs or those adjectives? Future. Him, he, what is it? Future tense. Um, no, it's, it's well, far, the person. Third person, right? First person is I or we. Second person is you. Third person is he, him, they. Right? <coughs> so throughout here now, it's been he, them, they. It's been third person. Here in verse eight, I am the alpha and the omega. What person do we have now? First person. First, 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 first person. So whoever this is, is making a strong declaration. All right, so I am the Alpha and the Omega. Who is saying this Christ. according to verse 8? The Lord, the Lord God. Who is and who was and who is to come? Who did we say back in verse 7 that was? Christ. Christ. No. The Father. The Father. Oh. Here's the Father breaking in 
and actually speaking. Normally it's Christ. But who spoke at Jesus' baptism from heaven? This is my beloved son. The Father. The Father. Who spoke at his transfiguration? The Father. The Father. This is the Father breaking in here. And it's important that you get that this is the Father at this point. He is, he is who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. <clears throat> he says he's the Alpha and the Omega. And John, what are, what are Alpha and Omega? Beginning and end of the Greek alphabet. Right, which is the means of communication at this time. That's the lingua franca of the land. We're going to look at uh, Isaiah 41.4 and 44.6. Somebody care to read those? Who has performed and done this, calling the generations from the beginning? I, the Lord, the first and with the last, I am he. So God, the Lord, and the Lord, this is capital, this is Yahweh. Father, he says, I am first and the last. Isaiah 44, 6. Thus says the Lord. The king of Israel, the redeemer, the Lord of hosts. I am the first, I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. This is important if you ever talk to Jehovah Witnesses, they will agree with you in the Old Testament. This is Jehovah, as they call him. Or we would say Yahweh. Yahweh says, I am the first, the last. Besides me, there is no other God. In Hebrew, I am is John. The, what is I am? Translate that into Hebrew. I am Yahweh. Yeah. Yahweh. 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 At least they're similar. Um, <clears throat> I, I noted here on, on the study guide it says, and this is how the Father describes himself, God the Father. The first and last letters of the Hebrew alphabet, uh, so we're talking about the Hebrew now. Uh, that was the uh, Alpha and Omega is the Greek because that's what we're writing, and that's a language of communication. The Old Testament was written in Hebrew. The first and last letters of the Hebrew alphabet symbolize totality and eternity. They also symbolize the glory of God's visible presence in the cloud and pillar of fire during Moses wandering in the desert and God's presence filling the temple in Jerusalem. This is what a good, how a good Jew would see uh, the symbolic, the first and last letters of the Hebrew alphabet. So, and it's interesting here, uh, Almighty, the Almighty, which is in verse uh, 8, <clears throat> is only used to describe God the Father in the book of Revelation. So, who did we say the human author was of this epistle? John the Apostle. Who was interjecting himself in the middle of this reading? God the Father. Why? Why do you think God the Father would interject? Because the vision that's going to come is so out of this world, it's so hard to believe, it gives affirmation. This is for me. You Jews that struggle to believe in the Trinity, to believe in Jesus, this is for me. Jesus will go on to clearly call himself God as we read through this first chapter, but this is from Yahweh. And that lends a lot of credibility to the message, doesn't it? Yeah. God the Father. In fact, the whole Trinity has been named here. That adds that, uh, the, the, uh, the <coughs> affirmation of the Trinity itself. Yeah. All right. We made it through the first couple, uh, first eight verses. Let's read now verses 9 through 11. This is the vision of the Son of Man. Revelation 1, 9 through 11. I, John, your brother and companion in the sun, and keep them in patient endurance that are ours for Jesus. Look on the island of Patmos and Christ. A little louder, if you would, brother. In the testimony of Jesus, on the Lord day, Lord's day, I, will, I was in the spirit, and I heard behind me a loud voice like mm -hmm. a trumpet, which said, write a scroll, what you are, what you see, and send it to the seven churches, 
Atheist, Samaria, Pergamum, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardius, Philadelphia, Laodicea. I was scroll first. Sorry, Ron. Uh, <clears throat> okay. What is John saying to the attendant audience here, to this attendant audience in verse nine? Hi, John, the brother and partner in the tribulation. How is he a partner in the tribulation? Because he's experiencing the same. He's suffering because of Christ. Christ. Yeah, he's, he's on that island because he would he would. He refused to stop preaching Jesus Christ. <clears throat> if you remember from uh, our videos, one of the uh, uh, extraneous things from the Bible was that John supposedly suffered being boiled, put in boiling oil. He survived that. And they sent him to the Isle of Patmos. So he, he's not somebody that's, that's disconnected from what's going on in the mainland in the church, right? He's a partner. Would that be important to them as they get this message that's kind of yeah. far out and out of this world? Yeah. He knows what he's talking about. <laughs> yes, good catch, Norma. Thank you. It's yeah. kind of like sometimes I think a priest <clears throat> can be marriage counseling, like where they know they've never been married. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, he also says he's a partner in the kingdom. Well, the question is, what is the kingdom? Let's look at John 18, 36 to 37, which I will put on the screen. Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from the world. Then Pilate said to him, so you are a king? Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. For this purpose, I was born, and for this purpose, I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. So first of all, the kingdom is Jesus' kingdom. He is a king, and he does, a better way to look at this uh, is his reign and rule. It's another way to translate the word kingdom. And reign and rule works better for me. And I think for most of you, because we don't have things like kingdoms much anymore. But we do understand there's there's a, a, a either a plot of land or a people that somebody reigns and rules over. That's what Jesus is talking about. His kingdom is where he reigns and rules. And it's, is it of this world? No. no. His kingdom is coming in a fullest sense. But Jesus went around and part of his ministry was he preached that the kingdom of God is... Here, here among you because he brought it. How on earth could Jesus bring a kingdom? What did he do? Why did he come? He said he has come into this world to bear witness to the truth. What is the truth that he bears witness to? That he's God and he came to do what? Die on the cross for the sins of the whole world to redeem them so that through the resurrection we might know that we are forgiven of our sins and have eternal life. His kingdom comes to you by faith. When you have faith in your heart, that is God, Christ, reigning and ruling in you. Before that, who do you think was reigning and ruling in your heart? Devil. Yeah. Lock, stock, and barrel, baby. You didn't know it. There was a time when he was ruling in my heart and I didn't know it. I was just pleasing myself. And for the devil, that's fine. Because my sinful heart always opposes what God wants. It stands against his reign and rule. I had to have the Holy Spirit through faith come and set me right. It's not about doing what you want, Pastor Mark. It's about obeying what Christ tells you to. And I fail at that and I'm forgiven. And that's how strongly Christ is reigning and ruling in me. 
When I buck his reign and rule, instead of being cast out of the kingdom, I'm forgiven. And I'm set back on a straight course. That's repentance. I'm turning away from my sin and turning back to him. So the kingdom is faith. Faith in Christ, salvation, forgiveness of sins, and eternal life given to you personally in your baptism. That's when you received the kingdom. Make sense? That's when God began reigning and ruling in you, and he's doing it to this day. He's still reigning and ruling in you. Um, John says he's a partner in the kingdom. And how would that be? Let's look at Matthew 16, 19. will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven this came right after peter uh, gave his great proclamation if you are the christ the son of the living god and this is part of that um the keys of the kingdom of heaven and we would say this binding and loosing happens how if you're bound you're a slave right you're not free. If you're loose, you're free. free. What free. binds what binds you? Sin. Yeah. Your sin. John was there. He was one of the 12. They have the keys to the kingdom of heaven because when John declares what you're doing stands against the Lord and your unbelief will bind you to eternal damnation. That's true in heaven as well. But John can tell you your faith in Jesus Christ, given to you by the Holy Spirit, looses you from being bound and heaven eternal life is yours. We see it better in John 20, 22 to 23. Uh, this is Jesus reaffirming that in his resurrection. And when he said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. So where the power of the absolution comes in. It was given to the apostles and through them given to the church. So it comes from you. And because we want it to be good, right, and salutary and for people to be assured that it actually is Jesus' words, you bestowed that authority on me as your pastor. Is that why they say I is an ordained? Called an ordained servant of Christ, called by you, ordained by him. Announce the grace of God to all of you. So John is a partner in the kingdom. And guess who else is a partner in the kingdom? You are. Because you have that same right to tell somebody, hey, if you don't believe in Jesus, I'm telling you, you're going to spend an eternity in hell. And there's nothing you can do to change it. You can't do enough good works to win yourself out of there. But I'm also here to tell you that Jesus died so he could, the door could be open for you by faith. He did it all. He removed every single obstacle in your life that would keep you out of eternal life, and he gives that to you by faith. And that's you operating the same keys of the kingdom. And you can do that in your life, wherever you go, whenever you have a chance, whenever you have a chance to witness winsomely to somebody. Questions or comments on any of that? Make sense? You look like you're lost in the weeds. Still All right. Um, how does John provide an illustration of patient endurance? It's right after that in verse 9. Thy John, your brother and partner in the tribulation in the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus was on the island called Patmos on account of what? Word of God. The testimony in Jesus. Is he in his very life exhibiting patient endurance? Yeah. All he would have had to do is say, you know what, this whole thing about Jesus is a crock. I was one of the 12, and he really, he really did state that. No problem. I'll stop preaching. But instead, he chose suffering and tribulation because he knew the truth. He knew lying would send him to eternal hell. No amount of suffering can take away eternal life from you. Verse 10. 
I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. You want to guess what the Lord's day is? Sunday. What is it? Sunday. 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 In the beginning, uh, some notes on here, Jewish Christians work at worship two days a week. They continue to work at worship on the Sabbath because that's when they worship Yahweh. And uh, the other day was Sunday. And they worshiped on Sunday. Why? Because that was the day he rose. Yeah. And eventually they turned it into just worshiping on Sunday. And for us, each Sunday, we call it a what? Little Easter. A little Easter. Because every Sunday, even in the middle of Lent, we celebrate the resurrection. That's the Lord's Day. And so he's, John is worshiping, knowing full well when he receives this vision, he's celebrating Jesus' resurrection. And lo and behold, Jesus gives him this great vision of what that resurrection means for him and for the church. Given that day, what do you think John meant when he said he was in the spirit? I was there. He was there in worship. It was alone, but he was in his own worship. Yeah. Communing with the Holy Spirit through prayer and through God's word to him. How fitting is it that the vision occurred at that time? <laughs> Instead of uh, <coughs> God speaking to him through means, as he does through us, through the word, through the mm -hmm. sacraments, he had Jesus show up in person. So verse 11, he says, I heard a loud voice like a trumpet saying, write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamum, to Thyatira, to Sardis, into Philadelphia, into Laodicea. A voice like a loud trumpet. Who do you think that is? And those of you that have uh, the kind of Bible I do, what color is the font for that? Red. Red means it's who speaking? Jesus. Christ. Christ Jesus. Can't see him yet, but he hears the voice, and the voice is like a trumpet. You're there, and you're meditating in the quiet. What effect would that have on you? It would make you <laughs> Yeah. Grab your attention, wouldn't it? What else would it tell you about these words? Are they important? Yeah. Better listen. A trumpet was used to call people's attention to something important to announce that they didn't have loudspeakers. So, like if a battle was about to commence, you blew a trumpet. Hmm. Yep. This is a big announcement. Okay. With that, uh, let's read. Oh, you know what? Everybody's zooming at home. I, I'm sorry, I don't mean to forget about you. Please interject if you have a question or something. I don't want to forget about you. Are, are, are we all good there back in Zoom land? Yep. Yep. Uh, okay, let's read verses uh, 12 through 16. And I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me. And on turning, I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white like wool and white as snow. His eyes were like flame of fire, his feet like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace. And his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. And his face was like the sun, shining in full strength. Quite a vision, huh? Sounds like uh, John's grabbed a hold of some pretty good hooch. <laughs> some white lightning. Or uh, maybe delved into some magic mushrooms or something. This is an unbelievable vision. Notice here, he keeps saying, was like. It was like. The hairs of his head were white like wool. Like. What does like mean? Does it, does it mean that's actually what it was? Similar. 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 John, John is reaching out for descriptive words for something that's beyond his ability to imagine. I can't tell you exactly what I'm seeing, but it was like this. So like means it's close, but is that exactly what he saw? No. 
What he saw is far more glorious and far more powerful than what words can contain. Keep that in mind as we break this down and go through it. So, John said it's one like the Son of Man. Who called himself by that title? Jesus. Jesus. Let's read Matthew uh, 9, 2 through 8. Some people brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. And behold, some of the scribes said to themselves, This man is blaspheming. But Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Why do you think evil in your hearts? For which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Rise and walk? but that you may know the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paramedic, Rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he rose and went home. So here's Jesus calling himself who? Son of Man. Son of man. And he said to so the soul, the Son of Man, you know the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins? Who's the only one that should have authority on earth to forgive sins? God. 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 Connected with the Son of Man, Jesus is calling himself God, God. God, who can as easily heal and forget as he can forgive sins. It's no problem for either one. He can take care of afflictions of the body and afflictions of the soul. <clears throat> it's interesting to know the Hebrew word for Adam is uh, man. 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 So in that respect, when he says he's the son of man, what is he declaring? <clears throat> he's human, right? Born of a woman. God became one of us. He has taken on humanity. Jehovah's Witnesses wouldn't like that. They think he's an angelic being, but no. A full man. <laughs> And all the, 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 all the inside things that you have, lungs, bladder, heart, brain, and a human soul. But along with that, what else existed? Divine. The divine will and soul of God. Together in this person, Jesus Christ. One not being uh, taken in or uh, uh, assumed by the other but coexisting at all times. Always divinely human, always, com always completely human, always divinely God. Always. Well, so anyway, um, okay. that's, that's I have a, a question. About... Okay, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. I don't have your pictures on the screen right now, so I don't see it. You'll have to speak up. Go ahead, Norma. Uh, it says that <laughs> he was like a son of man in small letters, you didn't say he was the, but like a son of man. So it's like a human? Um, well, yeah. Um, but maybe a little more than that. We'll get to that. I mean, I know he's got all these other features, but I, when he said like a son, I wonder. Um, he, well, John, to John, son of man would be, as we see from this Matthew reading, would be who? Jesus. 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 Does he look like Jesus did when he said Hello? these things? No. No. I'm at Bible study. What's up? Like a son of man. In other words, he can tell oh. this is Jesus, but he's not looking like the okay. Jesus that he ever saw walking the earth. Okay? Okay. All right, and let's continue on now. We're going to go back to Daniel and look at some things in Daniel to help us figure out what other import, what other reason <laughs> Jesus used this son of man title. It's more than just, I'm God who's taken on human form. So Daniel 7, 9 through 10. Somebody care to read that. As I looked, thrones were placed, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow, and the hair of his head was pure wool. His throne was fiery flames. Its wheels were burning fire. Anyone take a guess who uh, Daniel was seeing? God. Uh, yeah. God the Father. Or God. 
a stream of fire issued and came out of from before him. A thousands, thousands served him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court sat in judgment, and the books were opened. God's the eternal judge. So Daniel is looking ahead into the future and seeing a vision of judgment day. But he's also going to see something else, and that's Daniel 7, 13 to 14. I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. And he came to the ancient of days and was presented before him. One like who? Son of man. Son of, son of man. man. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people's nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. Who is this son of man? It's Jesus. It's God the Son. It's Christ. Daniel saw him in a vision long before Mary ever conceived him. When Jesus was calling himself son of man, they should have got this. They would know this scripture. So Jesus was calling himself more than just taking on human form. He's this guy. He's a place where no other human being should ever be before the throne of the Father. Because all other humans are sinful and can't stand in God's presence, but he can't. And he's given something that no other human being would ever receive. Dominion and glory and a kingdom that will never, ever pass away. Does Jesus have that? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Saul, well, part of the Son of Man. If you're reading this as the uh, as the church at that time, you would fill all these blanks in. This is who this is. I have written on our sheet here uh, during the time between the Old Testament and the New Testament. It's interesting. Rabbis were teaching and writing in Alexander, Egypt, uh, and they had a commentary on this passage from Daniel. They said uh, that uh, God the Father represents the ancient of days and rules God's people on his behalf. Oh, that uh, Christ, um, um, that, that this, this is Messiah. They saw this as Messiah. Um, and it affirmed his preexistence and identified him as the anointed one, the Christ, the Messiah. So they knew that this Christ who was coming, this Messiah, well, they should have known that he was divine. He was part God and part man, and he was going to rule over all things, more than just rule over the Roman Empire. Uh, he will be a light to the Gentiles, and he will be in charge of the resurrection and the judgment. All of this was being taught by rabbis before Jesus ever appeared on the scene. So take that, what was being taught by the rabbis, and this passage of the Son of Man, and it's pretty darn clear who Jesus is calling himself. <clears throat> That's why they didn't like it when he called himself the Son of Man, and, and, and started to talk about him being equal to the Father. No, 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 you can't be that one. You're not that one. So when Jesus called himself the Son of Man, what should, his, what should the hearers at this time be thinking? This is the Messiah. This is the Christ. This is the Savior. This is God in human flesh. John is seeing someone like the Son of Man. This is Jesus. But like Jesus has never, ever appeared before. Let's take a closer look at verses 13 to 16. And in the midst of the, of the lampstands, one like a son of man, clothed in a long robe with a golden sash around his chest. We'll get to the lampstands in a minute. But uh, a long robe with a golden sash around his chest. What are those, what does that, uh, the, the long robe and the golden sash signify? And of course, uh, the Old Preach. Testament was the Bible. Yeah. Preach. Very good, Reverend Art. And we can see that by ex, uh, looking at, um, oh, I'm sorry, we had something else here. Um, keep in mind what John is witnessing here. He's seen it before. Here you go. Ooh, now, about eight days after these sayings, he took with him Peter and John, the apostle, 
his disciple. And James went up on a mountain to pray. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face, Jesus was altered and his clothing became dazzling white. Is that kind of happening here? Yeah. John has seen this before. He's seen something mm -hmm. like it, but he's never, ever experienced it this intense. Bible scholars and, and commentators have said that's why John's gospel doesn't have a transfiguration. John had something better that he, had, that he witnessed himself. All right, so let's go back to that long robe and golden sash. Uh, Exodus 28 4. Uh, Moses wrote, These are the garments that they shall make a breastpiece, an ephod, a robe, a coat of checkered work, a turban, and a sash. And they shall make a holy garment for Aaron, your brother and for his sons to serve me as priests. Zechariah 3, 4. And the angel said to those who were standing before him, remove the filthy garments from him. And to him, he said, behold, I have taken your iniquity away from you, and I will clothe you with pure vestments. Priests that served in the temple and in the tabernacle had to be pure, white. They had to bathe. They had to put on clean clothes. Why? Because those clean clothes symbolized a spiritual reality, which was what? Purity and sinlessness. If the priests are going to go before into the presence of God and give sacrifices in his presence, they can't go in filthy and sinful. They have to be cleansed. And so the first thing the priest had to do was give sacrifices for himself to forgive his sins. And then he could take the blood in to forgive the sins of the people. And that clean white garment represents sin, sinless purity, which is why we talked about in the sermon last Sunday, and uh, when infants used to be baptized, they put a white robe on them. It symbolized the washing away of sin and the purity that baptism brings to all who believe. Priest is wearing a turban and a sash and a robe. Jesus is wearing what? Long robe and a golden sash. Because this is telling us Jesus is what? priest a priest we ever heard in scripture of jesus being called a priest no yes and hebrews let's go there john <clears throat> since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens jesus the son of god let us hold fast our confession for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who is in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Here is Jesus dressed as our high priest who took the once and for all offering his own blood in the presence of God the Father, and it was accepted to forgive our sins. No other sacrifice needs to be offered, yet he remains there to continue to speak for us. When the devil accuses us of our sin, Jesus is there as high priest to say, been taken care of. The final sacrifice was given, and that's me. John sees him as dressed as our great high priest. He went to the cross, came back from the tomb, and rose to be at the right hand of God to do that priestly work for us. So there's the long robe and the golden sash. How does John describe uh, Jesus' face and his body in these words, in this, in this chapter here? Look at verse 14 and 15. Hair was white like wool, was white as snow. His eyes were like blazing fire. And the next verse. His feet were like bronze glowing in the furnace. His voice was like the sound of a rush of water. This overall vision of Jesus, what picture do you get? Brilliant. White. Flashing out. Whiter than snow. Whiter than wool which would have been one of the whitest things that they would know back then. Brilliance. Glory. The glory of God, the Father himself, 
Jesus is not just reflecting it, he's radiating it in such a strong way that it's going to affect John big time. Uh, let's compare uh, what John is seeing to this vision from Daniel uh, uh, 10, 4 through 9. Daniel says, on the 24th day of the first month, as I was standing on the bank of the great river that is the Tigris, he's over in Babylon, he's one of the uh, exiles that was taken to Babylon from Jerusalem, I lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, a man clothed in linen with a belt of fine gold from Uphaz around his waist. What does that sound like? Priests. Priests? Sounds like a lot like Jesus in this vision, doesn't it? His body was like beryl, his face like the appearance of lightning. <coughs> His eyes like flaming torches, his arms and his legs like gleams of burnished bronze, and the sound of his words like a sound of a multitude. Is that a lot like what we're reading here in Revelation? This vision of this person who appears to John is uh, the pre-incarnate Christ. He's appearing in the glory of God the Father himself. You're a good Jew or even a Christian. You know, Daniel, you're reading this and you get it. You get it. This is no ordinary man that he's seeing. This is Jesus. But like Jesus has never, ever, ever appeared before. Why would white hair, what would white hair make John's audience think of? Well, Daniel 7, verse 9, another vision that, uh, back to that vision of the Ancient of Days, uh, Daniel wrote, as I looked, Thrones were placed, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was white, white, white as snow, and the hair of his head, and his throne was like fiery flames, its wheels of burning fire. How is Jesus looking to John? Very similar. He's looking like God, the Father, because he's appearing in the very glory that belongs to God the Father to John. He's appearing as God in human flesh, but now all of his glory is shown. He said his face was shining like the sun in full strength, John writes. So let's compare what John is seeing now. Let's go back and we're going to look at Matthew and Mark and their version of the uh, transfiguration. Matthew wrote, and he was transfigured before them and his face shone like the sun and his clothes became white as light. Uh, Mark 9 has, and he was transfigured before them. His clothes became intense, radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. Similar to this, isn't it? It's more. It's far more. So what I was taught somewhere along the way is the transfiguration was Jesus peeling back the covers to show a little bit of the glory that he really had as God the Son in human flesh. Here's a little peek at it, guys. And it messes them up so bad that Peter wants to build temporary shelters for dudes that have been long dead. <clears throat> the gospel say he was babbling. He did not know what he was saying because he was overcome. That was only with a little bit of the cloak peeled back. John is getting the full blast of God, the glory of God that Jesus has as God the Son. How Jesus will look when he returns on the last day. Not necessarily with a white robe and a golden sash. Remember, John said it's like this. He's trying to describe to you something that's beyond our imagination, and that's Christ shining with the very glory that belongs to God the Father himself. John writes that he has a two-edged sword coming from his mouth. Any guess for what the two-edged sword coming from his mouth means? Long gospel. Long gospel, so it is what? The word of God. The word of God. Does it make sense that's coming from Jesus' mouth? He is the word made flesh. Hebrews 4 tells us, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. God's word works powerfully in it, doesn't it? The law and the gospel. That's coming from Jesus' mouth. That's the symbol. So did John really see Jesus with a sword coming out of his mouth? I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. Is that what we're going to see on the last day when Jesus returns? 
No think so. This is symbolic. It's describing realities that are beyond our understanding. But we do know and confess that the word of God, Jesus spoke it. It all comes from him. And in fact, as Lutherans, we say the Old Testament is about who? Yeah, it's our work in church. How do we read the Old Testament? What's it about? Jesus. Jesus. It's about Jesus. Same thing as the New Testament. All of scripture centers on Jesus. And that's the beginning to understanding any portion of scripture. How does it reflect on Jesus? Those sacrifices that they had to make in the Old Testament, those were all placeholders pointing toward Jesus. the Lamb of God who would come and be sacrificed for the whole world. And he had to come because could mankind ever make themselves good enough? No. no. Good. And as Reverend Art said, it's a double-edged sword because that's what scripture is made up of, law and gospel. So see, Jesus and John, they were good Lutherans, right? <laughs> okay. Uh, we are going to finish up here, verses 17 to 20. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead, but he laid his right hand on me saying, fear not. I am the first and the last and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive evermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. Write, therefore, these things that you have seen, those that are and those that are to take place after this. As for the mystery of the seven stars you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. What is John seeing? He's seeing Jesus and all the glory of God appearing before him. And how does it react in that vision? Verse 17. As though dead. Here's where Greek helps. Greek has two words to describe somebody die. There's one word as if I just keeled over right now and died, you would use that word. I've just died. There's another word if you had come in and it had been several days and you found me laying here and I'm a corpse. Okay. No life left in me. Clearly, my spirit is gone. The word John uses is the one for corpse. I fell down like a corpse. I had no life left in me. Which John is saying, what happened to him when he saw this vision? He died. He more than fainted. He Does that make sense? No. Let's look at Exodus 33, 18 to 20. Moses said, please show me your glory, speaking to God, God the Father. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord, and will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But he said, you cannot see my face for man shall not see me and live. Moses yeah. couldn't see the glory of God full born as it would kill him. Jesus doesn't appear among us in his full glory in our bodies as we are now because it would kill us. Instead, he lovingly wants to be present with us. He comes to us through means, through the word, through the water of baptism, through the bread and the wine. That's how he's present with us. But here he comes to John full born with all his glory. John couldn't stand in his presence because he's sinful, and he died. John writes, but he laid his right hand on me, saying, fear not. So what did Jesus do? He brought did it. Back. Brought him back. Yeah. Brought him back. Like the widow's son at Nain, like the little girl who had died. Right. Questions? Okay. <clears throat> Jesus refers to himself, this is very important, in verse 17. He says, fear not, I am the first and the last. Does that ring a bell with you? Oh, Who called himself the first and the last? Isaiah 41? God, yeah. Yahweh. He said he is the first and the last. What is Jesus claiming to be clearly now? God. God. The same God is back in the Old Testament. The same God that Isaiah talked about. He is God. And if you're a Jehovah Witness, you cannot get around this. 
they'll have to admit because you can take them to Isaiah first and show them, ask them, who is this? That's Jehovah. Right on. Cool. What is Jesus saying here? Because this is clearly Jesus talking. He's calling himself clearly, not an angel, not the firstborn of all creation. He's calling himself God. And chances are they will leave because they have no answer for that. They don't want to hear it. He also calls himself the Alpha and Omega. Who called himself the Alpha and Omega? Look back at verse 8. God the Father. Jesus calls himself the first and the last, the Alpha and the Omega. Over and over, he's saying, I am God. I am. How do we know this is Jesus speaking and not the Father? Look at verse 18. I'm the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore. God the Father come and die? No. <coughs> Holy Spirit die? No. It's Jesus. Because it's got to be Jesus, and you can't get around it. And he says, I have the keys to death and Hades. How was it that Jesus has the key to death and Hades? Let's look at Romans 6 uh, and Romans 14. Romans 6 says, we know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. He holds the keys to life and death, to the place of eternal punishment, and to the place of everlasting life. Then Paul writes in Romans 14, for to this end Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord of both the living and the dead. He holds the keys to death and Hades. And how is that? What are those keys? It goes back to, uh, to what we talked about earlier when Jesus gave the keys of the kingdom to the disciples. What's the deciding factor on the last day on where you go? Faith in Jesus. What did you do with the faith that the Holy Spirit gave to you? Did you let the Holy Spirit keep it alive in your heart or did you throw it away? Throwing away who Christ is, that opens the door to Hades, and there's no turning back. But on the last day, if you hold faith in your heart, and it's not because of what you've done, it's because of what the Holy Spirit continued to do every time you came into the presence of the Word and sacraments, then the kingdom of heaven is open for you, and no one can take that away. Who Christ is to you, by faith or lack of faith, that's the keys to heaven and to hell. We're all keys. That's what will matter on the last day. Do you have faith? Make sense? Questions or comments? One more, one more final thing. We have the seven stars. What is significant about the seven stars that are in his right hand? Uh, Jesus talks about it. He says the seven stars uh, are the angels of the seven churches. Remember what the number seven is? Seven is the Trinity, working through all the world. So the seven stars are all of the angels that work in all the seven churches. It's good to know that in Greek, angels can mean angelic beings, but it can also mean messengers for God. And so this is one of those that has a double meaning. Yes, it does mean we believe that there are angels that watch over all the churches of the world, but it also means the human angel the human, the human messenger, the pastor. The called and ordained pastor is where? Where, where are these stars at, as far as Jesus said? In his right hand, the hand of power, protected by him, <laughs> kept in faith and directed, protected from the assaults of the devil in the world. And then the seven churches, well, they're lampstands. Why would the churches be called lampstands? Because they spread the light to the world. Yeah. And who is the light? Jesus. Jesus Christ. It's our job. The world's getting pretty dark out there, isn't it? Not just because it's becoming nighttime, but with all the stuff that's going on in the world right now, what is our job? It's not to solve, to end the war in Ukraine. It's to shine the light of Christ. That finishes off our 
uh, chapter one. Any comments or questions that you wanted to make that you never had a chance to because I just kept talking and talking. And talking. <laughs> Yeah. Was this good for you? Good. Did I chase you away, or you'll be, will you be back next next Wednesday? Why don't round it? If if I'm going too fast, or also let me know if we're getting in the weeds too far. And if your mind, I mean, your mind's going to kind of be spinning. But if it's really really bad, let me know. We can back off a little bit. But there's a lot of good things here, isn't there? There is a lot being said. So next week we'll begin chapter two. With this out of the way, uh, Jesus has given his command. John, I want you to write letters to these seven churches. And of course, our seven, do you think that's a literal number of churches? No. It represents all the churches that exist on earth. And that's why we're reading it here in this no, church. It's sure, the same. It's said to us. All churches throughout all the lands of all time. All right, let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for this wonderful, wonderful letter. Hard to understand, but through various means, looking back in the Old Testament and looking back in other scripture passages and understanding the mind and the situation of the church at that time, we can get a better understanding of what you're trying to say to us here in the 21st century. Keep addressing us through your spirit. Lift us up. We need this message of hope and faith in the midst of what we're going on as well, and what will continue to go on until the day that you return. All this we ask in your precious name. Amen. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everybody. All right. Bye. Bye. Thank you. I'll be your name. I'll be your name, brother. Oh.